multiple tools in photography. They can be used to make super high resolution photos by combining many long focal length images into a wide angle field of view, allowing for large print sizes viewing on large displays and even wide angle shallow depth of field portraits. They can be used to produce multiple images, capturing a scene in its entirety might reveal different compositions, and you won't be constricted to a traditional DSLR aspect ratio either. And finally, panoramas are just a great way to capture a landscape or a scene that can't be summed up in one field of view. But taking perfect panoramas is not easy, and most photographers don't recognize the proper gear, technique, and software required to produce the seamless transitions between images. In this guide, I will teach you how to construct panoramas, explaining the process I use to create these stunning images. First, briefly, what is a panorama? A panorama is a special type of photograph that depicts a field of view that is considerably wider than the one that could be captured in one exposure. This involves taking a number of exposures that capture overlapping sections of a scene, then stitching those panels together in computer programs. This wider field of view is not only great for capturing more of your scene, but because you're taking multiple full resolution photos and stitching them together, the resulting panorama should have massive resolution, sometimes upwards of 100 megapixels, which is great for large prints and other applications. The tricky part about capturing panoramas is that all the panels in the image must be properly aligned and have sufficient overlap in order to make the stitching process easier. While you usually don't need specialized gear to do photography, making a high quality panorama will require a few things. First, you will want to pick up a nodal slide. A nodal slide will allow you to slide your camera assembly back and forth along your tripod head, letting you center the nodal point of your lens over the panning point of the tripod. What is the nodal point? The nodal point of a lens is its optical center point where light rays converge and then separate again to fall on the imaging plane. Its position inside the lens is not easily discernible, so we will need to find it ourselves. For this, you will need two objects, one positioned close to the camera and one far away, that are in a straight line with the camera. For this, I used a piece of masking tape on a window. First, position the lens of your camera in vertical alignment with the center of your rotation head. Then, rotate the camera to observe the parallax of the two objects. As you can see, when the camera rotates, the two lines become separated. This effect is undesirable in panoramas, and it will make stitching hard. Once you observe the parallax, adjust your camera along the nodal slide and find out at what position the parallax effect disappears. Record this position for future use. This operation only needs to be done once for every lens. Along with the nodal slide, an L bracket will let you easily rotate your camera between horizontal and vertical positions. You can find them for relatively cheap. A sturdy tripod with a rotatable head will also be necessary to effortlessly pan the camera. If desired, a special rotary base with degree markings and locking knobs can be used to precisely rotate your camera assembly. As for the camera and lens combination, any camera with a manual mode will suffice. Because you will need to keep the exposure consistent throughout your panorama, this feature is a must. For the lens, it really comes down to personal preference. If you want to stitch just a few images of an ultra-wide angle scene, then a wide angle lens like a 16-35mm may work for you. But if you want to capture the same scene in more detail, then using a longer focal length lens will give you more resolution in the form of more panels, so you may want to consider a telephoto lens. Shooting the panorama is relatively straightforward. First, position your lens so that it is straightened over the center of the rotation axis. Second, adjust your lens in the nodal slide to the predetermined position. Then, lock down your camera settings. I always shoot full manual for panoramas, making manual shutter speed, aperture, ISO, white balance, and focus constant throughout the process. Use proper metering techniques and take test shots to make sure no part of your scene is either under or overexposed. Decide how many panels you want and whether you want a multi-row panorama and starting from one edge Sweep your camera across your scene, capturing pictures along the way. To make the stitching process easier, I suggest overlapping your frames by about a third. If your camera has a rule of thirds grid, enable that and use it to maintain a sufficient overlap. Editing the panorama can be done through a number of workflows, but I will be using Adobe Lightroom and Microsoft Image Composite Editor, or ICE, to edit and stitch my panoramas. First off, I always edit each panel in Adobe Lightroom. 
While the adjustments you make will depend on your scene, try and match your edits between panels. Usually I will just use the synchronized function in Lightroom. I would also recommend enabling lens profile corrections. For my experience, this helps when combining the photos in ICE, but you may want to experiment with this. After exporting all the panels as TIFF files, I will use Microsoft ICE, a free panorama stitching program, to combine my shots. First, import all your edited panels into ICE, then click Next. Microsoft ICE will then begin forming the panorama, and depending on how many panels you have, and the computer hardware you are using, this step may take some time. Grab a coffee, and maybe watch some of my other videos if you feel like it. After ICE has done its magic, you can choose which panoramic projection you think fits the image the best. Oftentimes, a spherical projection is chosen by default, and I find it to produce some wild distortion, so I usually go with stereographic or perspective. The matrix on screen is also a tool to adjust the roll, pitch, and yaw of your panorama, adjustable with a simple click and drag. Once you are satisfied with the projection, click Next. Now we are cropping the image. On screen you can see the full panorama, and using the auto crop feature, I'm going to crop in on the area of interest. After cropping, click Next and export the panorama as a TIFF image. Make sure to check the box Include Alpha Channel. This step also might take some time. The next step is optional, but if you feel like your image needs a bit more fine tuning, feel free to import the panorama TIFF file into Lightroom for further adjustments. Even if you don't need to edit it further, I suggest at least converting it to a JPEG, which can also be done in Lightroom. As you can see, this panorama has more resolution and more field of view than one single image, and even within the photo, I can find some compositions that could stand on their own as separate photos. With the right gear, shooting technique, and image processing, anyone can make stunning panoramas that can add a fresh and unique look to your portfolio. And that concludes this complete guide to panoramic photography. Remember to rate the video, leave a comment with your feedback, and let me know if this video helped. Subscribe to and support the channel if desired, and as always, thank you for watching.